All right. Um, it's 12.03. I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds for today. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Heather Gornick. Uh, she's co-director of the Vascular Center at University Hospitals Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist, Dr. Gornick completed medical school at the University of Chicago. She went on to receive additional training in internal medicine, cardiology, and vascular medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston, where she was also a chief resident. She previously worked at Cleveland Clinic for 13 years, where she was medical director of the non-invasive vascular laboratories and section head of vascular medicine. Dr. Gornick is an internationally recognized expert in the care of complex vascular diseases, particularly fibromuscular dysplasia, an uncommon disease of the arteries that can lead to narrowing, aneurysm, and dissection. She currently serves as a member of the Medical Advisory Board of the Fibromuscular Dysplasia Society of America and serves on the steering committee of the United States Registry for FMD. She collaborates with clinicians and investigators worldwide to advance the understanding of this potentially morbid vascular disease. In addition to her work in FMD, Dr. Gornick is a nationally re regarded expert in non-invasive vascular diagnostic testing and serves as the president of the Vascular Testing Division of the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission. Dr. Gornick has led the development of national guidelines related to the diagnosis and clinical care pathways for patients with vascular disease. She is currently the immediate past president of the Society for Vascular Medicine and serves as editor-in-chief of its journal, Vascular Medicine. Uh, and with that, I would like uh, you all to please join me in welcoming Dr. Heather Gornick. Thank, thank you very much, Keith, for that generous introduction. I'm excited to be here today. And I'm not talking about fibromuscular dysplasia, but we're gonna focus on atherosclerotic disease today and hope to give you a guided tour of the arterial tree. Uh, before I start out, I have no personal disclosures, but our uh, hospital has received funding for a fellowship from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. All right, so my agenda and objectives for the next 50 minutes or so is to give you a guided tour of the arterial tree, and we're going to recognize clinical manifestations, screening indications, and diagnostic approach to four common peripheral vascular disease entities. Hopefully convey treatment approach to these problems, help you learn to recognize when you need to refer to a vascular specialist, and then as we go along, I'm going to highlight some of the specialized clinical programs for peripheral vascular disease we have right here at university hospitals. First, I just want to say a word. You heard a bit uh, from Keith about the Vascular Center. This is an entity within the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. And our goal is to become a national leader in destination in vascular care. And shown here is the leadership of the Vascular Center, Vic Kashup, Mehdi Shishabor, and myself, bringing different perspectives, surgical, interventional, medical, to the vascular uh, service line. Uh, we have a wonderful collaborative multidisciplinary team, vascular surgeons, vascular medicine specialists, intervascular, inter interventional vascular specialists, vascular technologists, nurses, advanced practice providers, wound care specialists, podiatrists. Uh, really, we all work to, together to advance vascular care and research and education. Uh, we're a growing enterprise in Northeast Ohio, uh, from Parma to Illyria, all the way to Jaga and Portage, we have a vascular center uh, clinics and activities. And I, since this is Medicine Grand Rounds, I want to briefly mention vascular medicine, which is an important component in the vascular center. Our director is Dr. Teresa Carmen, who's been here at University Hospitals for about 10 years. And we have a growing uh, cast of vascular medicine specialists within internal medicine here at, at UH, uh, listed here, including Dr. Natalie Evans, Dr. Kendi white Solero, and our interventional vascular colleagues, Dr. Angela. Gupta, Dr. June Lee, as well as Dr. Mehdi Shishabor. Uh, 
And I'm also uh, very pleased to inform you that we've also recently started a vascular medicine fellowship program. And we have our first fellow, Dr. Kirillis Suriel, completing his first year. And we are very excited to welcome uh, UH alumnus, Dr. Dylan Gibson, who I see on the Zoom today, to join us in July. All right, with that background, I'm gonna take you now on this guided tour of the arterial tree. We're gonna start at the feet and move our way up to the head a little, uh, a little backwards. So first of all, I just wanna remind you that atherosclerotic disease is truly a head to toe process. Now I'm a cardiologist, so originally my initial learning about atherosclerosis was focused on coronary disease. But what we, we now know is that patients who have coronary disease often have atherosclerotic disease outside the body. In fact, it's really the rule rather than the exception. And the non-coronary atherosclerotic entities include peripheral artery disease of the lower extremities, but also the upper extremities, carotid artery disease, renal artery disease, mesenteric artery disease, many abdominal aortic aneurysms, and also vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. So these are all of the ways in which atherosclerosis or the primary ways can manifest. So the, among your patients with coronary disease, the PVD, the peripheral vascular disease is likely there, but it may need to be discovered or uncovered and that's up to, up to us. So how can we do that? We can start by including questions in our review of systems focused on identifying atherosclerotic PVD, such as, do you get pain in your legs when you walk? Do you have trouble walking? Have you had any sores on your feet? Have you had episodes of sudden weakness of a side of your body, difficulty speaking, sudden loss of vision? Do you get abdominal pain after you eat? Have you lost weight without trying? How has your blood pressure control been since I saw you last? Do you still smoke? How much are you smoking this, these days? Obviously tobacco, major risk factor for atherosclerosis. Has anyone in your family had an aortic aneurysm and do you have problems with erections? So these very simple questions incorporated into a review of systems can provide clues as to the presence of PVD. Uh, next step is to incorporate a thorough vascular exam. And on this slide is my exam for atherosclerotic disease. Highlighted in red are the key things. Listen for cervical bruise. Measure blood pressures in both arms. Try to palpate the abdominal aorta for aneurysm. Palpate and auscultate the femoral pulses. Um, if you're going to feel one pulse in the lower extremities for PAD, it's the posterior tibial pulses. That has the, the best sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of PAD. And importantly, you have to take off the socks and inspect the legs and feet for ulcers or other signs of vascular disease. I want to say a brief word about pulses, especially for our trainees. Uh, we really should all use the same language in, in referring to pulses. And there was a standardized grading system recommended by our PAD guidelines by the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. And that's the scale here. A normal pulse is a two, an absent pulse is zero, one is diminished, and three is a hyperdynamic bounding or aneurysmal pulse. So please use this scale when grading your pulses. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about lower extremity peripheral artery disease. In this case, I'm gonna focus on atherosclerotic disease. So first of all, PAD is highly prevalent. Uh, the prevalence depends on the population sampled and the characteristics of the population. In a broad uh, US general population survey called NHANES, it was determined that 14.5% of individuals above the age of 70 have lower extremity PAD. Uh, the prevalence varies by age and also race with African-Americans at highest risk. Um, in a German study, when they did survey in ambulatory care clinics, they found a prevalence of PAD of 21% in people above the age of 65. And then in a US study called Partners, which screened patients for PAD in ambulatory care clinics, they found a prevalence of 29% in patients at risk. <laughs> 
According to the American Heart Association, national prevalence is 8.5 million Americans above the age of 40. And globally, it's been estimated that 202 million people have lower extremity PAD, the majority in lower middle income countries. The risk factors for PAD are similar to coronary disease, but the primary risk factors are tobacco use and diabetes, which are especially important, as well as age. Uh, some emerging risk factors include chronic kidney disease as an important risk factor for PAD and especially severe PAD and amputation. It's been shown that Blacks are at higher risk of developing PAD and progressing to amputation due to PAD, um, but unfortunately less likely to receive limb-saving revascularization. And some recent data suggests that a heart healthy diet, especially the Mediterranean diet or a high fiber, high fruit and vegetable diet may reduce risk of PAD over the lifetime. I do wanna mention a wonderful effort by, led by Dr. Kendi White Solaru here at UH, one of my colleagues, which is called Hype the Cure. And she is doing a research initiative, a screening for both hypertension and PAD among at-risk black men in a barbershop setting. And she actually just conducted a pilot study in two Cleveland barbershops with the, with the results uh, pending. But this is an ongoing area of work using a novel venue to screen for PAD and potentially even implement therapeutic interventions down the road. Uh, in addition to PAD being common, PAD is, is a high risk cardiovascular condition associated with high mortality. Um, here are a few quick statistics. In one study from San Diego, PAD increased the risk of all-cause mortality and a six-fold increase risk of cardiovascular mortality compared to those without PAD. It's been shown that for every Framingham risk category, having an abnormal ABI doubles your cardiovascular event and death rate. It's been demonstrated that among patients with PAD, 20% have a heart attack, stroke, or cardiovascular hospitalization or death every year. A PAD increases the risk of cardiovascular events even if you don't have leg symptoms. And most recently, there's been a number of studies and analyses which have shown that if you have PAD on top of coronary disease, you are in a particularly high risk category for cardiovascular events. So here's the clinical spectrum of PAD. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I find this disease so interesting. It has such variable clinical manifestations. At one end of the spectrum, we have asymptomatic patients or subclinical patients. Uh, what's been shown is these patients, actually, if you objectively measure, have impaired walking abilities compared to those without PAD, even though they don't have symptoms. Then we have the classic claudication that we uh, learned about in textbooks, which is recurrent leg symptoms, burning, aching, fatigue in the leg muscles that comes on with predictable level of walking and resolves with a predictable duration of rest. Uh, also can have other leg symptoms that aren't those classic claudication symptoms. And then we have the more severe PAD categories, critical limb ischemia, which I'll mention in a moment, and acute limb ischemia, which is the six Ps we learn about in med school, the acutely painful, pulseless, and cold um, leg that will become paralyzed if, they're, if not revascularized emergently. This is a very simple screening tool for claudication you can use. It's called the Rose Claudication Questionnaire. It's two questions. One, do you get pain in either leg when you walk? And two, does the pain go away when you stop walking within 10 minutes? This has an extremely high positive predictive value. And if the answers are yes to both questions, the likelihood of angiographically confirmed peripheral artery disease has been shown to be greater than 95%. So if you get two hits on this questionnaire, your patient has PAD. Uh, the problem is those yes and yes patients the intermittent claudicans we have since learned are really the tip of the iceberg for this disease process. And actually as shown here with data from the PARTNERS trial, the majority of patients with PAD do not have those classic symptoms. It's actually 89% either don't answer yes and yes, or they don't endorse symptoms. 
But again, it's been shown, and this is work uh, really spearheaded by Mary McDermott at Northwestern and colleagues, that even if those patients don't answer yes or yet, yes and yes, if they have PAD, they have impaired quality of life and function compared to patients without PAD. Briefly want to mention critical limb ischemia. This more recently has also been referred as chronic limb threatening ischemia. So CLI or CLTI, you will see those terms. This is chronic se severe limb ischemia due to peripheral artery disease. And it's been present for two weeks or greater associated with ischemic rest pain, a non-healing ulcer or gangrene. And risk factors for developing critical limb ischemia include a lower ABI at baseline, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, ongoing smoking, and blacks are at particularly high risk of CLI compared to, to white patients. CLI can result, has a high rate, you can see some data here, um, patients who are have a high rate of amputation, especially if not treated with revascularization. And you can see here a 25% primary amputation rate um, in some of older data. And actually, um, if you go out a year, 25% uh, of patients with CLI are deceased and another 30% are alive but have undergone an amputation. So CLI requires urgent referral to a vascular specialist. Briefly want to mention our limb salvage and CLI program here at UH in our vascular center. This is really a national referral center for CLI care and endovascular therapies, especially for patients who've been told they have no options for revascularization and need an amputation elsewhere. Um, under the leadership of Dr. Mehdi Shishabor, we have something called the Limb Salvage Advisory Council, which is actually a multidisciplinary review uh, via a Zoom meeting of patients who are being considered for amputation to have an extensive discussion and see if there are any other options for revascularization, wound care uh, to minimize tissue loss. How do we diagnose PAD? The cornerstone is the ankle brachial index. This is basically the measurement with a handheld Doppler device in a supine patient at rest of blood pressures at the ankle and at the arms. And how we calculate the ABI, we use the brachial pressure for the denominator. Um, the higher of the two arms is the denominator for both limbs. And then we measure blood pressures at the posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis artery, and we take the higher of the two ankle pressures for our numerator. And this can be done in the office setting, as shown here, very simply with a handheld Doppler device or with more advanced technologies that'll give you also some waveforms. And these are the standardized diagnostic criteria for an ankle brachial index. A normal ABI is between 1 and 1.4. The diagnosis of PAD and an abnormal ABI is less than or equal to 0 0.90. We have a borderline category. Many of those patients who fall in between 1 and 0.9, if you repeat an ABI after walking them on a treadmill, will fall. And then I do want to mention that in some cases, the ABI is very high. The ankle pressures are very high, and that is not necessarily a good thing. Um, actually, that usually means the vessels are non-compressible, either to diabetes or chronic kidney disease, and the ABI is not accurate. And you need another test, uh, such as the toe brachial index or other vascular studies to diagnose peripheral artery disease. And we have multiple additional modalities to assess at PAD and, and localize anatomically where the disease is and if it's amenable to revascularization. As mentioned, we have exercise ABI and segmental pressures and waveforms in the vascular lab. Uh, we also have imaging options, duplex, CT angiography, MR angiography, and invasively catheter-based angiography. Imaging is generally reserved for highly symptomatic patients when revascularization is being considered, especially catheter-based angiography. We rarely ever need to do diagnostic catheter angiograms. And the choice of the best test, is it MRA, is it CTA, is it duplex, is really determined by patient-specific factors and local expertise. <laughs> 
briefly want to mention management of PAD. This is what I teach my fellows. It's a three-pronged approach. We need on the top, prevent the heart attack, stroke, and death for which these patients are at risk. We want to protect the feet and prevent amputation, and we want to improve function and quality of life. Uh, there were clinical practice guidelines published on PAD. I was heavily involved in these back in 2016, and we are in the process of updating the AHA ACC multi-specialty guidelines now. So stay tuned for um, an update next year. I briefly want to mention protecting the feet and preventing amputation. It's vital for diabetic patients and patients with PAD to take off the socks and look at the feet at every visit, even if they're coming to see you in general medicine clinic for a blood pressure check. It's amazing um, the number of times we find ulcers the patient didn't even know they, they had. Um, we wanna also educate the patient to look at their own feet. We reinforce the importance of foot and nail care appropriate footwear, including orthotics and diabetic shoes is necessary. And we collaborate a lot with our podiatry colleagues for these patients. And very importantly for patients with PAD, they need to know that they can worsen, that they can are at risk for critical limb ischemia or acute limb ischemia. So I tell them about, you can have a leg attack and if you're getting severe pain in your leg or you have a sore that doesn't heal, that's the sort of thing you need to call in about. It's not the kind of thing I want you to wait until you see me next in two months. Next, uh, we have therapies to prevent cardiovascular events. And shown here is the armamentarium we have for PAD. It's very similar to what we have for coronary disease. Smoking cessation is vital antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy, lipid lowering therapy, statins for all patients with PAD, ideally inten high intensity statins, additional therapies for some, a blood pressure control with the best data for ACE inhibitors or ARBs, glycemic control for our diabetic patients with PAD, and an influenza vaccination and now a COVID-19 uh, vac vaccination as well. Um, it's there's some emerging data that some of these therapies not only prevent heart attacks and strokes, but may also prevent amputation and may help with claudication. I briefly want to mention three areas where we have some new data for medical therapy for atherosclerosis. One is with regard to antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy. For PAD, current guidelines recommend aspirin or clopidogrel alone for symptomatic patients. Uh, there was a very important study published a few years ago that I will mention called the COMPASS trial, which assessed the efficacy of rivaroxaban, which is an oral anti 10 a inhibitor, alone or in combination with aspirin for prevention of cardiovascular events in patients with coronary disease, PAD, or carotid artery stenosis. And this was a very large trial of uh, more than 27,000 patients, and it had three arms, uh, aspirin, an aspirin alone arm with a placebo, a rivaroxaban alone arm, or an arm that had aspirin low dose, 100 milligrams a day, and low dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. And this study was actually stopped early by its DSMB because of efficacy. And uh, the overall trial um, was positive, but there were some particularly positive results in the subset of patients who were enrolled with lower extremity PAD. Um, I won't go into great detail, but what they found that is among the patients with PAD and carotid disease, the combination of the aspirin and the low-dose rivaroxaban significantly reduced the primary endpoint of cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death, heart attack, and stroke. Um, and then if you looked only at patients with just lower extremity PAD, that combination of aspirin on top of, I'm sorry, low-dose rivaroxaban on top of aspirin reduced major limb events such as amputation with a 67% uh, risk reduction, need for vascular intervention, or development of ALI or CLI compared to aspirin alone. Uh, there was a cost of, not surprisingly, uh, major bleeding but this has emerged as a promising new therapy for patients with PAD. 
The other area with a lot of excitement is in lipid lowering therapy. Uh, there was a study called Fourier uh, years ago, again, a huge trial of more than 27,000 patients who had atherosclerotic disease, heart attack, stroke, or PAD, and they were on statin therapy and randomized to the PCSK9 inhibitor evolocumab or, pl or placebo. Uh, these patients were followed over time for cardiovascular events and for lower extremity events. Um, the patients in the evolocumab group lowered their median LDL from 94 down to 31 milligrams per deciliter, very uh, low levels. And in the evolocumab group was associated with a reduction in cardiovascular events and also limb events, amputations compared to placebo. And it was interesting, the cardiovascular benefit was actually greater among patients with PAD than patients with just coronary disease. And finally, the other risk factor with some exciting data for PAD is in diabetes and PAD. And as you'd expect, glycemic control is important for patients with diabetes and PAD, especially in the setting of critical limb ischemia and wounds. And there's been some emerging data on the GLP-1 agonists for, that, for reduction of cardiovascular events, especially with liraglutide and semaglutide. And the liraglutide data actually suggests reduction in amputation among diabetic patients with PAD. Uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, impagliflozin and others also show promise for reduction of cardiovascular events. But uh, one study with canagliflozin uh, suggested a signal for increased risk of amputation with this drug. And for that reason, uh, we tend to avoid canagliflozin for patients with PAD and history of wounds or critical limb ischemia. This is an area where a lot more research is being collected. I want to mention a wonderful program we have in the HHVI called the CINEMA program. Uh, this is led by Sanjay Rajagopalan, Ian Neeland, and Sadir Alkindi. And this is a program for patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease. And they have, I've sent many of my patients to this program. They help out with the GLP-1 agonists or the SGLT-2 antagonists. They have a terrific team that includes a diabetes educator, uh, various medical specialists, pharmacy support, and a nurse navigator. So this is a wonderful program called Cinema. great resource. They actually have a standing order in the e EHR. Um, just put in Cinema. type in Cinema, it'll pop up. Okay, so all of this cardiovascular risk reduction piece seems pretty obvious, right? Statins, antiplatelets, it's a no brainer. The problem is for patients with PAD, these therapies are woefully underprescribed. Shown here are a series of large uh, cohort studies from 1999 to 2020. And you can see we're still having statin prescription rates for PAD in the 30% range. Um, which is really quite shocking. Antiplatelet therapy, 30%, very low rates, especially if you exclude people with known coronary disease. So there is a lot of work to be done here. Now for PAD, I wanna briefly mention improving function and quality of life. We have one FDA approved of efficacious medication for claudication, and that is Solostazole. Uh, I wanna just dispel the myth, pentoxine, Pentoxyphylline or Trental is not efficacious for PAD. This has now been demonstrated again and again in clinical trials. So we need to stop using that drug for PAD. We have Solostazole, which has been on the market since 1999. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It has many pharmacologic properties. It's actually an antiplatelet agent, so may need to be stopped before surgeries. It's a vasodilator. It has effects on the lipid profile and it actually prevents intimal hyperplasia in stents. Um, nobody's exactly sure how it helps walking pain, but it does work. Um, it cannot be used in patients with CHF of any severity, and that's related to trials of other phosphodiesterase inhibitors in heart failure that had adverse outcomes. Problem with this drug is it, it is associated with side effects, especially diarrhea, palpitations, and headaches. 
In terms of the efficacy data, uh, solostazole versus placebo, you get about a 50% increase in maximal walking distance uh, versus 24% with placebo. So mo modest, moderate efficacy, uh, but it is our one FDA approved drug for claudication. The therapy we have that is incredibly efficacious for, for PAD is supervised exercise therapy. And this is given a 1A indication in the PAD guideline. And supervised exercise therapy improves walking performance, your pain-free walking distance, and your maximal walking distance by 150 to 180%. It improves physical function, quality of life, and also the cardiovascular risk parameters with all that exercise. It's safe, it's highly cost-effective when compared to catheter-based revascularization, and it can also be used as an adjunct with lower extremity revascularization. Uh, after many years of a strong evidence base and no coverage, we finally got a national coverage determination for supervised exercise therapy for PAD in May of 2017. So this therapy is now available uh, to our older patients and, and younger patients as well. And it, uh, the coverage determination covers up to 36 sessions over a 12 week period and potentially another second course of supervised exercise. We have a wonderful exercise rehab program here at UH. I've been so impressed with this program and the quality of what we provide for our patients. There are many sites throughout the health system which provide supervised exercise therapy for PAD. And all you have to do is type in this vascular rehabilitation referral. So this, pay, this service is broadly available for our patients, is woefully underused. Please use it for your patients with PAD. Last thing I wanna mention for PAD is revascularization. And there's really been a revolution in this field where endovascular and catheter-based procedures, this has actually gone even further up over time, have overtaken uh, lower extremity surgical open bypass procedures. We've really moved into an endovascular first era. And there's a lot of things we can do endovascularly for patients with PAD. These are some cases from my colleague, Mehdi Shishabor. This is a patient with severe by iliac occlusive disease who had kissing stents uh, performed to treat that obstruction. Here's a patient with SFA occlusion where the SFA can be recanalized with various balloon technologies and stents. And this is a case of a patient with critical limb ischemia with a non-healing ulcer, abnormal ABI, very poor perfusion to the foot, severe disease below the knee with really no vessel runoff to the ankle. And uh, there are now wonderful, very small artery techniques, including techniques of pedal access. This is a real passion for Dr. Shishabor where these small arteries can be recanalized. And you can see here, this patient ended up with two, two uh, vessel runoff to the ankle and an intact uh, pedal arch. And look at that improvement in the pulsatility of blood flow and healing of the wound. So there's a lot we can do endovascularly for these folks. In terms of indications for revascularization, the critical limb ischemia and acute limb ischemia, those are revascularized now. Um, the patients we don't need to revascularize are the asymptomatic patient or the minimally symptomatic patient. And then we have a, a number of patients in between who have vocational necessity. They're the mailman or the Amazon delivery driver. They've tried supervised exercise, but they're still not improving or they have nice focal aortoiliac lesions with high likelihood of good success with endovascular techniques. And those folks are in the middle and it's really a shared decision-making discussion. Okay, now I'm gonna move us upward to the abdominal aorta. We're gonna talk about abdominal aortic aneurysm. So aneurysms can develop throughout the aorta, thoracic and abdominal. Uh, Aneurysm comes from the Greek of dilatation and aneurysma, and we define an aneurysm as a 50% increase in aortic diameter from contiguous segments. 
And if the normal abdominal aortic diameter is two centimeters, a triple A would be three centimeters or greater. Most abdominal aortic aneurysms are in the infrarenal location above the iliac bifurcation. And triple A rupture accounts for about 10,000 deaths per year. The global rupture rate is declining, perhaps due to screening programs. Um, AAA prevalence is about 4 to 5% of men, less so in women, although women have a greater risk of rupture. And risk factors for AAA, similar to PAD, include older age, tobacco smoking, but also male sex, family history of AAA, hypertension, and atherosclerosis in other vascular beds. Um, interestingly, patients with diabetes are at decreased risk of AAA and tend to have smaller growth rates. And there's some emerging data on inflammation and genetics for AAA development. At one time, AAA screening was controversial. Now it's really um, apple pie. It's been demonstrated that ultrasound screening decreases AAA-related mortality, though not all-cause mortality. These patients tend to die from heart attack and stroke. And AAA screening is recommended by multiple groups for selected patients. There is a Medicare screening benefit for AAA, which has been available as of January 2007. It's available to men ages 65 to 75 who have ever smoked, and men and women with a family history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Previously, it had to be ordered as part of the Welcome to Medicare physical, and it was very underutilized. There was some changes made in the regulation, and as of 2014, it no longer has to be coupled to that Welcome to Medicare physical. In terms of management of AAA, a smoking cessation is the only therapy that might slow the progression, and then we target risk factors for cardiovascular disease, just like we do for everything I just mentioned for PAD. The average growth rate of an abdominal aortic aneurysm is somewhere between two and a quarter to two and a half millimeters per year. Smokers, ongoing smokers have been shown to have more rapid expansion. Diabetes has been shown to have a slower expansion. Um, and the Society for Vascular Surgery has actually published guidelines on ultrasound surveillance. Uh, they, they're actually they're pretty conservative than prior guidelines and imaging less frequently, but every three years for very small aneurysms, annually for more moderate size and more frequently or refer for repair as they approach five to 5.5 centimeters. And with AAA, we want to actually repair when the risk of uh, repair is lower than the risk of rupture. And the risk of rupture increases with increasing aortic diameter. These are data uh, from Mayo Clinic and then a, a composite uh, data source. And you can see as the aneurysm gets to six centimeters, you have rupture risks of 20 to 25% per year, very high. So the Society for Vascular Surgery has published guidelines on AAA repair. In general, it's 5.5 centimeters for a fusiform AAA. For women, a smaller diameter is considered because they have a higher rate of rupture at a given diameter. Uh, saccular aneurysms are often repaired regardless of their size. They have a different natural history. And there's considerations to repair smaller aneurysms for patients who are undergoing organ transplant, chemo, or radiation therapy. And then we always repair sizable symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysms or those that are growing rapidly. And in terms of AAA repair, uh, there are options. There's open or endovascular repair. Open repair is a large operation, very morbid with large incision here. This is a case from my colleague Vic Cash up here where a surgical graft is implanted to exclude the aneurysm. There's been an endovascular revolution in AAA management. Uh, here is an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm, and you can see there's access either cut down or percutaneously of the, through the groins and deployment of the EVAR device, the endovascular device with multiple modular interlocking components. And you can see here the end result. And there really has been, again, a revolution in um, EVAR versus open repair. And currently, more than 75% of abdominal aortic aneurysms are repaired endovascularly. 
Uh, the choice of EVAR versus open depends on anatomy and patient substrate. And there's now been multiple randomized trials that have shown that EVAR is associated with decreased risk of perioperative death and early complications versus open surgical repair. Uh, Long-term, the mortality is equivalent with the two approaches. Usually the stroke and cardiovascular disease catches, um, catches up on that early benefit. And there's been some concerns about EVAR not being a free ride because it does require long-term CT scan surveillance for endo leaks and higher rate of repeat intervention. Now I'm gonna move on up to something we don't really talk about that often, subclavian stenosis, which is upper extremity PAD. And I wanna briefly mention this because it's surprisingly common. It identifies a patient as having atherosclerotic peripheral vascular disease, it's easy to diagnose, and it's often missed and sometimes embarrassing to miss. Subclavian stenosis is most commonly due to atherosclerosis, less commonly vasculitis or other entities. It's been estimated to be found about 7% of patients in a clinical setting. The risk factors are similar to the risk factors for lower extremity PAD. And patients who have PAD are at risk for subclavian stenosis and vice versa. And it's been shown that just having subclavian stenosis is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. The clinical manifestations of subclavian stenosis are inaccurate blood pressure measurements, because if you're measuring blood pressure in the stenotic arm, it's gonna be low and your patient may actually be hypertensive. Arm claudication, coronary subclavian steel in the presence of a lima graft, vertebral subclavian steel, and sometimes embolic phenomena of the hand. In terms of management, we treat with medical therapy for PAD, all the treatments we've already discussed. We do rarely revascularize in the setting of severe arm claudication or symptomatic steel syndromes, or for patients who need a cabbage using a lima graft. And in 2021, the treatment approach is almost always endovascular. I recommend measuring blood pressures in both arms at least once in patients at risk for atherosclerosis. And a difference in blood pressure of greater than 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury is how you make the diagnosis. And patients should have their blood pressure measured in the arm with a higher blood pressure. And definitely we need to screen for this prior to coronary artery bypass grafting if a, a mammary artery is going to be used. Um, you can also send your patients to the vascular lab and we'll do a fancy study like this where we measure blood pressures in both arms and we get waveforms. These are plethysmographic pulse volume recordings. And you can see here, this patient has about an 80 millimeter mercury blood pressure gradient in the arms and the left-sided waveforms are abnormal compared to the right. And then we can even image the vertebral arteries. And we see in this patient, there's bi-directional flow or an element of subclavian vertebral steel. And then these are the, usually these lesions are at the origin or the proximal segment of the subclavian artery and treated with stenting. This was a patient who was having chest pain and dizziness when using her left arm and previously had a mammary artery graft. All right, to wrap up here, I want to move us toward the head and talk about carotid artery stenosis. So we're gonna to focus today on atherosclerotic disease, but as you heard in my introduction, I spend a lot of my time focusing on fibromuscular dysplasia of the carotid artery. We can also have vasculitis or arteritis involving the carotid artery, but we're gonna talk about carotid atherosclerosis. Stroke is now the fifth leading cause of death in the US that's actually improved over the past decade. And it's thought that carotid atherosclerosis accounts for 20% or less of ischemic strokes, um, usually from an atheroembolic mechanism. And the risk of a stroke increases as the severity of carotid artery stenosis on that side increases. Uh, significant carotid artery stenosis is not common in the general population but it's more common among patients who have peripheral vascular disease elsewhere, peripheral artery disease or coronary artery disease, not surprising. This just came out, I believe last week, but the US Preventive Services Task Force has now weighed in for a third time and said that 
all comers in the U.S. population should not be screened for carotid artery stenosis. It gets a level of recommendation D, and I agree with that. Um, however, there are patients who should be screened for this, and I think there's some nice guidelines that were published now about 10 years ago from the American Stroke Association and other groups. And it says that patients obviously who have neurological symptoms, TIA or stroke, should be screened. Patients who are known to have a carotid stenosis from other modalities should undergo an ultrasound. Um, patients who have a carotid brewery, there's a 2A recommendation to get a carotid duplex. And then a 2B recommendation where things may be beneficial is patients who have PAD or carotid disease or AAA, those other entities, subclavian disease, it's reasonable to get a carotid duplex or if they have multiple atherosclerotic risk factors. And then they recommend against screening patients with carotid duplex if you have no clinical manifestations and no risk factors, or if you have uh, other neurologic disorders that are non-vascular like brain tumors or epilepsy. And how we do carotid duplex is we use grayscale ultrasound as shown here to image plaque and then we use color Doppler as shown here and spectral Doppler to assess flow. And higher velocity flow indicates a narrowing in the carotid artery. A uh, carotid duplex is highly dependent on the equipment and the sonographer or technologist using the equipment. So it's really important your studies are performed by a, with good quality equipment in an accredited vascular laboratory. And I won't go into this in detail, but all vascular labs have diagnostic criteria where they categorize disease on duplex into broad buckets. We're not saying there's a 62% stenosis. We're actually saying there's a 50 to 69% stenosis. And these are based on velocity parameters and plaque related parameters. But beware, there is no universal standard for carotid artery stenosis criteria. And these criteria vary from facility to facility. So I'll just share with you a couple examples. This is a patient who has plaque. This is the external, this is the internal carotid artery. You can see shadowing plaque here. The velocity is 178 centimeters per second, which is elevated. And using our chart, our criteria, that is a 50 to 69% ICA stenosis. Here's another patient who has more extensive plaque seen on grayscale imaging, very high peak systolic velocity over 400 centimeters per second, um, elevation of a velocity ratio that we also use, and this would be a greater than 70% ICA stenosis. In terms of management of carotid stenosis, like the other entities, most of our patients are medically managed and 21st century medical therapy would include antiplatelet therapy, generally aspirin, but there's data for symptomatic patients for combination aspirin and dipyridamol or clopidogrel. And then as previously mentioned, the COMPASS trial did include patients with carotid artery stenosis and showed a potential benefit of low-dose rivaroxaban, a top aspirin, compared to aspirin alone. Smoking cessation, intensive statin therapy, and blood pressure control. And then we do ultrasound surveillance to monitor for progression. The frequency depends on how severe the stenosis is at baseline. We educate our patients about the warning signs of a TIA stroke or retinal ischemia because symptomatic patients with a greater than 50% stenosis require urgent revascularization. And then in terms of the indications for revascularization, there's been multiple trials. Time doesn't let me get into all of them in detail, but they show that there's benefit for carotid stenosis for symptomatic patients with a greater than 50% stenosis and especially greater than 70% stenosis and asymptomatic patients with a greater than 70 to 80% stenosis. In terms of how we treat carotid artery stenosis, we have uh, two to three options. Historically, carotid endarterectomy was a standard approach. There's a longitudinal incision made in the common and internal carotid arteries. And then at most centers, a vein patch is placed after the plaque is removed to prevent restenosis. 
And um, among vascular surgical procedures, this is a lower risk procedure, procedure with relatively low risk of stroke MI or perioperative mortality uh, and a short hospital stay. There is a potential for cranial nerve palsy uh, due to injury at the time of surgery. Carotid artery stenting emerged in the 2000s, and this historically is done through a transfemoral approach with lower risk of no need for general anesthesia, lower risk of heart attack compared to endarterectomy. But there are concerns because passing wires and catheters across the aortic arch and into the carotids, there's a risk of plaque embolization with procedural TIA or stroke. And there's been years of technological advances for carotid artery stenting, including different types of emboli protection device, devices to actually capture uh, plaque at the time of the stent deployment or alter flow through the carotid at the time of the stent deployment. And for selected very high risk patients, carotid stenting is unquestionably the first line therapy at many clinical centers. And that includes people who have hostile necks with radiation or prior carotid endarterectomy, contralateral carotid occlusion, nerve injury, or high cardiac risk. And that's a carotid stent. Uh, where the controversy is, is the normal risk patient. This is a real hot topic in the vascular space. There have been two seminal randomized trials, CREST-1 and ACT, which randomized, there's been others to randomized patients to carotid stenting or carotid endarterectomy. Um, the, the bottom line is it, it seems the outcomes are similar. Uh, there's a slightly higher rate of periprocedural MI with endarterectomy and a slightly higher rate of periprocedural stroke with stenting, especially in less experienced centers. There also may be some interaction with age where older patients may have better outcomes with endarterectomy versus stenting. And this is really a hot topic. You'll see surgeons and interventionalists in a heated debate about stenting versus endarterectomy, what's, what's worse, a perioperative MMI or a perioperative minor stroke, and um, this remains controversial. There's a large study ongoing in Europe, which is randomizing patients with at very experienced facilities to carotid endarterectomy or carotid stenting, and hopefully we'll get us some updated data to inform this debate. Uh, but this, who knows, maybe um, less relevant in the future as there's been a lot of technical technological advances in endovascular treatment of carotid stenosis. And our group here at UH, Vic Kashup and Norm Cummins have been very heavily involved in something called TCAR, transcarotid artery stenting, where you bypass having to go up the aorta and the aortic arch with the wires, and you actually access the carotids right through the common carotid artery for deployment of the stent and there's novel um, embolic protection systems that actually divert flow from the common carotid artery back to the femoral vein. So you prevent embolization as you're deploying the stent. And this is called TCAR, and our group here has been very active in clinical trials for this technology. Uh, the last thing I'll mention about carotid disease is all of this revascularization may be moot in the future, because the truth is medical therapy for peripheral vascular disease has greatly improved over time. And in these times of these older studies, the medical therapy arm barely got aspirin. But now in the 2021 studies, they're getting aspirin intensive statin, maybe PCSK9, ACE inhibitor, ARBs. So what they've seen is the event rates in the medical therapy arms have gone dramatically down. And it's a question of, is medical therapy alone now adequate for asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis? And are these debates on the revascularization technique still relevant? And this is a seminal trial that hopefully will answer this question. It's the CREST-2 trial. We are a site here at UH with Vic Kashup as our PI, and it's randomizing patients in two subtrials to medical therapy versus endarterectomy and medical therapy versus carotid stenting. Mm -hmm. Uh, patients get very aggressive medical therapy, and it will demonstrate, do we need revascularization at all um, to improve outcomes in the era of modern medical therapy? So stay tuned for CREST-2. So I, I hope I've convinced you that atherosclerotic disease is a head-to-toe process. Um, the peripheral vascular disease is likely there, but you may need to discover it. 
I hope you're further empowered to recognize these entities and improve the health outcomes from your patients. And uh, please know the UH Vascular Center and the various programs I mentioned are here if you need us. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Zoom clapping. Thank you so much, Heather. Really, the, the, the patients and the system is so fortunate to have such a national leader, fantastic clinician, educator, investigator, you know, uh, here. So that was a fantastic grand rounds. I think outside of a couple of COVID topics, that was the best attended by the number of participants on Zoom. So there you go. Um, and, and there's a lot of questions in the chat and we can go over a little bit. So Hilward Lazarus asked about um, GMCSF therapy for PAD. Um, that was the first question in the chat at 1230. Yes, um, that has been studied for critical limb ischemia in a few trials and there was early promise Unfortunately, when it's gotten beyond the initial phases of study in larger RCTs, it has not shown benefits. So it's been disappointing. Stem cell therapy, growth factors, um, unfortunately a disappointing area, but still ripe for investigation. Awesome. Thank then, you. Uh, thanks. For, Richard Joseph put a plug in for vascular rehab. And then um, uh, Hyen Kamran asked about um, uh, Plavix compared to low dose Zerolto in CKD patients, especially with the CURE trial showing improved CV outcomes in PAD patients. Okay, I to be honest, um, Dr. Cameron, I'd have to review those um, data specifically. I cannot comment on that. I'll have to take it offline and look at that data sub study. Send me then, an email. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Heather. And then Dr. Chohan uh, said DP and PT palpable pulse, but patient may have PAD. So I guess the question is maybe that what's the sensitivity of having a, a, a two plus dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial and, and, and being concerned about PAD? I guess that's the question. Yeah, um, don't quote me on the specific numbers, but it's moderate, the physical exam. I think you get in the 70s. Um, if you're going to feel one pulse, it's really the PT. The, the dorsalis pedis can be anatomically absent or anomalous in about 15% of people. So you don't feel it, but it's, it's actually not a sign of disease. Um, I, I think if you have bounding peripheral pulses, like truly two plus, the likelihood of PAD is low, but there are patients with aortoiliac disease, um, who will have significant PAD. Awesome. Um, and then Suzanne Schaefer asked a question, given small artery size of arteries in women and increased risk of rupture, AAA should recommendations for AAA diagnosis and monitoring be different in women? And I, I will say our vascular medicine department is, you know, well represented by, uh, <laughs> by anyway. Well, I, I think it's, it's a great point, and it is a, one of those controversies in our field. The problem is a lot of the um, studies that looked at AAA screening interventions did not study women. So there's limited data set on, on the efficacy of these programs, coupled with that, the lower prevalence of AAA in women. Um, the, guide, the professional societies actually recommend AAA screening more forcefully than what ended up in the Welcome to Medicare, which is only screening women if they have a family history. I think that's flawed. Um, on exam, if you've got an abdominal brewery or you think you feel a pulsatile mass, those are clinical indications for AAA screen. So sometimes that's a way to work around. Gotcha. Awesome. Then uh, last question, post revascularization, how long is recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy? Six months a year, question mark. Yeah, that is another really controversial issue because it depends on the nature of the vascularization. Was it a balloon only? Was it a drug-coated stent? Was it a drug-coated balloon? Tremendous heterogeneity in terms of what different interventionalists will use. So always ask your interventionalist. Um, usually they're dual treatment for at least six weeks, but some people tend to treat longer. And again, it depends on the, the specifics of the procedure. Gotcha. And the one last question just came in. Does normal ABI rule out ischemia as a cause for foot ulcers and poorly controlled diabetics? Is there an entity of microvascular flow? 
That's an awesome question. And whoever asked it must be a, a plant. I didn't have time to get into that. He, he's a, <laughs> a, a consultant to a medical consultant to surgeons in the prescribing uh, question. It's a great question. Um, I didn't have time to get into the details, but it's interesting. If you have lower extremity wounds, um, probably a straight office ABI is not enough because I mentioned those non-compressible vessels and the ABI is falsely high. You can have an ABI that's not greater than 1.4, but it comes back as 0.8 or 0.9, which is normal or mildly reduced because it's partially non-compressible and actually the perfusion is horrendous. So the guidelines say if you have a wound, you can't just do an ABI. You got to also do a waveform and toe brachial index. Um, actually, Mehdi Shishabor and Tara Kamad, who is joining us, um, did some research on ABIs in patients with critical limb ischemia. And patients can have normal ABIs. It's just because the ABI is not accurate in that population. Awesome. Well, Heather, this was a fantastic talk. We're going to send the recording out to uh, all trainees at UH. I think it's really important to talk for trainees no matter what field they're in. And uh, I, I learned a lot, which probably reflects my poor knowledge base going in. But it was a fantastic talk. So thank, thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for What's the CME? What's the CME number? Yeah, the CME, it's, um, it's, it's in the chat, 43354. I put it in the chat a couple of times. Four three three five four. And watch that fantastic voyage movie. I saw your uh, chat, Keith. Isn't that a great movie? I it love is. it. <laughs> no, your first slide with the, like the little, you know, little submarine in the foot. That's the. Uh, but I, you know, that's why I don't think any residents or fellows have probably ever heard of Fantastic Voyage. So there you go. Click on the link. Okay. Thanks, Heather. Bye, everybody. Bye.